you to know that I'll do my very best to keep this program under control. There are no guarantees that I'll accomplish that feat. The decade of the 1960s brought a new breed of revolutionary into the limelight. It was the sort of a rebellion that stood for a purpose. There was a newfound freedom in taking a stand or just doing something because it felt good. I remember that. And for <laughs> the generation of the 60s, they made their point loud and strong. It was a time when the young wanted to stay that way forever. When the national slogan, don't trust anyone over 30, became almost a conspiracy, and for good reason. After all, the 60s decade was a quagmire of political and cultural experiments. 1968, the climax of the 60s era, coughing up that decade's greatest number of acidic images. By the close of the 60s era, the baby boom generation had lost its innocence. In the 70s decade, many readily embraced the sexual and drug revolution. We really had nowhere to go for the right answers, and so there was no base for our understanding of the issues. And so the only place at that time was to turn to ourselves. Many of us turned into ourselves. Many turned to drugs. They had been raised in the traditional churches and synagogues of America. But these children had decided that the religions of their childhoods were irrelevant to them. And so they abandoned their roots in search of truth. I had formed my own lifestyle according to my own um, understanding. And in the sense that I was robbed of my idealism about relationships, about love and marriage, about fidelity, about all the things that I now hold so dear that uh, I, was, I was robbed. I was robbed of my idealism. Their rock and roll heroes, the Beatles, had turned to a guru, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, in pursuit of the meaning of life. At Woodstock, truth seekers learned the basics of yoga for a high they were promised would be better than any drug they had ever taken. By the 70s, fascination with both the occult and cult groups was growing, sometimes with tragic results. They had become a generation that was always learning, but never coming to a knowledge of the truth an interesting line. One of the strongest vehicles for sending a message in the 60s was through music. With us today are three men who were there when the music was being made and they were making it. And they were doing a good job of it. Roger McGuinn, the founder of the rock group The Birds, known for such songs as Turn, 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 Mr. Tambourine Man, 12 Miles High, where he lived. Mark Lindsay. <laughs> I, I couldn't use it. <laughs> Mark, uh, 8 Miles High. Yeah, well, I was well, he was 12. Four, <laughs> he was 12 Miles High. He sang this. So, he was 12 Miles High. <laughs> yeah, he was See what I mean? I can't help. I've lost it already. Uh, Mark Lindsay was lead singer for the group Paul Revere and the Raiders, who performed the hit, among many others, Indian Reservation is one. And with us also, Barry McGuire, known for his hit, Scared Me Half to Death, Eve of Destruction. Please welcome our musical guest from the city. Whoa, man. Hey, you, you guys uh, don't look bad for guys your age. You don't <laughs> we never thought we'd be this age, I promise you. Uh, Isn't that the truth? Absolutely. Did you think you'd live to it? I, n I never thought, uh, I didn't see a reason to get past 30, you know, when I was 25. Now, it's funny how your perspective changes, you know? I, yeah. didn't, I didn't live through it. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you look so good. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I died in 1971. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Looks good, doesn't he? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know. I think there was a number of us had a death wish back then. I just, I think I did. I went out and did some pretty wild and crazy things, guys. I'm yeah. subconscious, but if anything, I... You think so? I think, well, on my part, I, yeah. yeah. I wasn't trying ahead. to die. I was trying to live. I was looking for God. I was, uh, I was trying to uh, make people happy with my music. Um, it, was, it was a good time. I enjoyed life. I still do. I remember... Uh, one of your uh, compatriots in music at that time was David Crosby. David Crosby, indeed. And I remember, excuse me, David, for giving away stories out of school on television, but I remember one night we got stoned out of our minds on grass and pills and booze and uh, talking about these uh, seismic convulsions that were taking place not just in the system of the world around us, but within ourselves and among 
our friends. When we would sit around and talk about this kind of stuff, did you experience that, Barry? Was there, were there things going on out there in the ozone that we didn't really know what we were touching? Uh, I don't, you know, I don't know what you guys experienced. Uh, <laughs> I, I think all of us, you know, had a personal experience. Certainly, I did. Uh, I, I was just, I started off in a group called the New Christie Minstrels and sang songs like Green Green and Saturday Night, and boy, it was a lot of fun. And, and uh, then all of a sudden, I started noticing that people weren't really being honest with me. Uh, I'd hear one story in the street, another story on stage, another story at a private party, and, and when you get one-on-one -on -one with somebody, uh, they might almost show you all of themselves. And I would see these different levels of honesty that we all went through. I sang for two different presidents at the White House. I, you know, performed on concert stages all over the world. And uh, I started thinking, well, people aren't being honest. You know, I'd see a guy coming on to a girl, and her husband would be coming on to, you know, his wife. and. And, I, and they were playing all these games, and I thought, well, why don't they just quit playing these games and get honest and, you know, all go in the bedroom and be honest <laughs> with each other. Well, that, but that was the honesty, wasn't it? I mean, if we're going to yeah. love one another, then we're going to abandon some of these traditional values. Yeah, that, that's true. Uh, that's, that's what I say. I, I couldn't figure out why we didn't, you know, what was the Judeo-Christian morality hang-up anyway? Why don't we just get rid of that and get honest and have some fun? And, you know, my parents, when I was a kid, they said, uh, well, you can't do that. And I said, why not? They said, well, because nice people don't do that. And I said, well, why not? And they said, well, they just don't. And I said, well, why? And she says, well, your granddaddy didn't do it, and by God, you're not going to do it. Uh, okay. <laughs> and well, so I didn't know. So when I hit the street, and I went out and I met people, and they said, why don't we do these things? And I said, I don't know. Well, let's try it. So we tried it. <laughs> and it was a lot of fun, and nobody got hurt at first. You know, it was very euphoric, very sensual, uh, you know, you know, it was a great time. And uh, so then we started, we threw all the rules away. You know, I mean, we looked at our parents and they weren't happy. I mean, they had all the stuff that was supposed to make them happy. They had homes, swimming pools, recreational vehicles. They had all the stuff, college degrees, but they were on Valiums and, and boozing themselves and divorcing and, and fighting each other and, and, and so all the kids, we looked at our parents and said, why should we go to school and get like them? Mark, did you go you through know? the why's too? Yeah, I, I think uh, he's pretty much hit the nail on the head. I looked around and saw, you, you heard traditional values preached to you all your life, right? Yeah. You grow up and you say, well, wait a minute, this, this doesn't seem to be working. Nobody's having, I mean, they seem to be, they may be saying they're having fun or, or this is the way to live, but nobody's really doing anything. Uh, it was very hypocritical. Yeah. Nobody, was, yeah. nobody was really happy. And, I mean, nobody really said did what they said you were supposed to do nobody lived like they were preaching that you were supposed to live everybody was miserable so i think uh i like a lot of other kids looked up and said gee i don't want to be like that yeah Roger? there must be a better way yeah, yeah, i saw up in the traditional church and i rejected it and uh in search of truth and uh and honesty in in everyday uh situations and is was that just i i don't know it obviously was a mindset at the time but I'm just wondering, I mean, what was it that drove us to that as a, in fact, a, it was a community throughout the world. I mean, I, people were thinking this way everywhere in our age. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, part of it, I think, was the, was the proliferation of communication. When in 1957, okay. when they threw up the first satellite, in the 60s they had now stationary uh, synchronous satellites, and you could talk to people all over the globe while you knew what was happening in China right now. You knew what was happening all over the world instantly. You knew what the kids in and Ohio were thinking and doing, and all of a sudden, it was really easy to communicate in this, in this new generation. Okay, and uh, they're still communicating today, and you'll hear how they arrived at some of the truths that they're living in right now. We're talking with Roger McGuinn, Mark Lindsay, Barry McGuire. We'll be right back. Meet Amanda King, compassionate mother. Housewives and mothers do this kind of thing every day. Dutiful daughter. Girl, where? And part-time spy. I'll cover you. You show me how to shoot. Kate Jackson stars in Scarecrow and Mrs. King, weeknights at 7 Eastern, here on The Family Channel. Gardeners, if you love fresh... Roger, were you responsible for the uh, the granny glasses trend? Yeah, uh, I was. 
<laughs> and, 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 oh, thank you, Roger. <laughs> and you didn't get royalties. Wow. No royalties. Huh? I never got royalties. They were just little glasses, and I, um, I wore them all the time. And um, pretty, soon, New York. pretty soon they were all over the place, and I didn't get a penny. It was great. <laughs> Boy, gosh. Now listen, I'm thinking about the music. Someone said that the music was sort of like a soundtrack of our lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were, you know, we lived with it, we, you know, reproduced to it, we uh, danced to it, ate to it, slept to it, woke up to it, I don't know. I mean, it, and someone says we're going to be buried to it. Do you think that's true? Um, I, think, I think that's probably true. If you look, I, do, I was reading the other day in the newspaper, I actually read, folks, I, one of the things I learned in the 60s, <laughs> and it said the Dewey Brothers are out, they're going to make $20 million on this new tour, and it isn't because they have, well, now they have a hit, but that's incidentally, it's going to be some albums. But they learned, kids learned of their music through, there are now radio stations in every town in America, music of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and a lot of it's the 60s. The people that grew up in the 60s wanted to take that music with them, and you're right, they'll probably take it with them to the grave. Why? Why? I know why. Uh, it's uh, oh. an emotional lock. <laughs> <laughs> it's an emotional lock that happens when you, when you grow up with music going on at a certain time of your life, you lock it. Like people from the, uh, the 40s who were like 20 in the, in the 1940s, love the, the big band music. They still listen to it. I live in a town where they have a radio station that plays nothing but that, and all the people who were 20 in the 1940s listen to that, and that's all they listen to. If you grew up with swing, you'll, right. you'll swing till you die. Sure. If you grew up with rock, that's you'll right. rock till you die. So that's what it is. Well, these guys, uh, a deep philosophical discussion here. <laughs> <laughs> all right, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Chu, oh, stand up. Stand up so we can see. Go ahead. Uh, I wanted to know where you're at today, spiritually, how does that affect uh, your music, and what does uh, your own song, Turn, 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 mean to you today? Well, first of all, it's my favorite song. Uh, I've always loved the song because it has an enduring quality, and it's from the Bible, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And I'm a Christian, a born-again Christian, and uh, I do write some Christian songs, but I don't feel the Lord's called me into a Christian music ministry, so I, I continue to do secular music at this point. Okay. All right, go ahead. Stand up. Yeah, go ahead. You have a question? Yes. Um, you think it's over? Well, no, you have my card. <laughs> oh, I have your card? <laughs> and you don't know what your question is without your card? <laughs> um, I don't have your card, um, so therefore we will never know your question. Okay. See if you can paraphrase. Um, the 60s to you, were the, was it a time, um, did it seem like it was the best of times, the worst of times? Um, in the sense, were we declining or climbing on the social and spiritual ladder, or were we just making a mess of it in general? Mm. It was both. I mean, we, I, were, we were looking for God. We rejected the, uh, the organized religions because we, it looked, we saw the hypocrisy in it. We were looking for God in Eastern religions through LSD and things. We didn't find him there. I came back to Jesus, but, you know, it took a long time. It took me about 20 years to figure it out. Yeah, I, I think it was both the best of times and the worst of times, but then it didn't seem like it was the worst of times. It, looking back in retrospect, there's a lot of things that happened that weren't great. There were a lot of things that happened that were great that set the tone for things that are positive now. There were things that set the tone for things that are negative now. It's, 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 a, it's a dichotomy. It's both, I think. Jerry? I was totally convinced that uh, we were the prophets of the, this age, you know? Just I, as, just I thought that. But yeah. no one, I thought you were the prophet. I, yeah, I, oh, uh, I still think he ha has a lot to say. I listen very closely to what Bobby says. I yeah. always have. Uh, I, I thought that we were going to change the world. You know, I thought that, that I couldn't wait till the next album came out so I could see what the new revelation was. Uh, I thought we were going to teach people what uh, real love and acceptance, uh, cross-racial, cross-sexual, cross-national, that we were going to evolve into the age of Aquarius. When I did Hair on Broadway, I thought that that was an ultimate statement of truth at the time when I did the show. I wasn't, I've never been an actor. I've never been able to act. But when I saw the script and heard the songs, I thought, this is not acting. This is, this is me. Mm -hmm. And I did it. I think a lot of us, uh, even, you know, I heard talking with uh, Timothy Leary uh, the, the other day, and, and uh, he was looking for truth and as best as he knew how to. We were all on a search, and, and we got little glimpses of things, but we were being tricked and didn't know it, you know, and, and a lot of people died because of the trick. Yeah, see, now, that, that's the thing that I would say, the kind of description you, you, you made there uh, in regard to the music of the era. 
Uh, I don't know how many people sat down and listened to Glenn Miller or Benny Goodman and said, a prophet is among yeah. us. Uh, you know, you know, I mean, honestly. But when I, I would sit, and I know what you're talking about. I'd sit and listen to Dylan stuff. I sat with Bobby. I got, excuse me, I'm telling you stories out of school again. But I, I, I got, I went on an acid trip with Dylan. I did, I went on one with the Beatles. And, uh, you know, that was out there. That was, in fact, I remember once being on a phone call with John Lennon on one end of the phone and Dylan on the other end of the phone, these guys talking, and we were all tripping. Now, that was a trip. Uh, <laughs> uh, what were we tapping into? Then, when, cause, for instance, the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi thing. Well, there, right. see, okay. Uh, all right. The show is going to be too short. You know, the stage lady's over there giving us the two minute sign or whatever. Peace well, sign. Peace sign. <laughs> <laughs> There, there, oh, are, man. there are absolutely things uh, beyond uh, our natural senses, and uh, LSD, uh, all of the psychedelic drugs, the psilocybin, peyote, uh, meditation, fasting, there are many ways to enter into spiritual awareness. But there's a scripture, I didn't know it at the time, but I read a little word, verse in the Bible one time where Jesus said, I am the only way into the kingdom of God, and if you enter by any other means, then you're a thief in God's storehouse you know and so from that scripture i thought then there's illegal entry you know and we were illegal entrants into the outskirts of the kingdom of god you know we were there illegally and we were catching glimpses of spiritual truths but because we were illegal entrants and our hearts were uh perverted we used the, well, the knowledge we gained to more skillfully manipulate people around i did i'm talking about myself Thank i mean I, I don't know what anybody else did yeah. But I used the knowledge that I gained from my spiritual adventures to more skillfully manipulate the people around me. At least I tried to. You know, but there was still a seeking of somehow, you know, I hated war, I hated violence, I wouldn't fight. I said one time, a guy's going to punch me out. And I said, well, if that's your trip, man, here's my nose. <laughs> you know? Well, did he take his trip on your nose? No, another guy saves me. <laughs> oh, yeah. right. Right, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Your question. Go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, th there was a lot of music with media produced in the 60s, early 70s. Of course, you've seen that everywhere on oldie stations now. Uh, what positive effects do you think that music could have in the 90s? Hmm. Well, a lot of people like to listen to it. It's, it's, got, um, it's got some enduring qualities. I think uh, the stuff that's based on, on good, solid melodies and and the things that have uh, things about love and, and enduring uh, personal relationships in them are still valid. Some, yeah, they're valid now. Okay, those were the idealisms of the 60s. Are they a reality? We have a couple of other guests joining us, and we'll hit that a little bit when we come back. Stay with I mean, I, I, I was a Elvis fan, but his reality was somewhere else. Was it, it was that? Elvis, uh, when he died, it really shook me up, I'll tell you. Uh, Did it? Yeah, because I was seven years younger than he was. He was 42 when he died, and uh, I was taking the same drugs, you know, Percodan, Steve, and all that stuff. And when he died, I went, uh-oh, if I only got seven years to live, I'd better make some changes in my life. Oh. Did you hear any? Uh, yeah, it's funny. Elvis was one, was one of my heroes. I had four heroes, and, and three of them died because they wouldn't take shelter. It was John Lennon, John Kennedy, uh, Martin Luther King, and one died because he had too much shelter. That was Elvis. So it was kind of hit me thought. that way. Barry, any thoughts on that? Uh, no, I, I never did like Elvis. And, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, there you go. Boy, old <laughs> Okay, uh, there's an old adage about speaking well of the dead, but there it goes right out the window. See, there's still a radical element in you today, isn't there? I, I just didn't like Blue Hawaii and Jailhouse Rock. <laughs> what about Winky's shirt? Winky, I like that shirt, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you said Blue Hawaii somehow. Okay, joining us now are co-authors Peter Collier and David Horowitz. They've authored the book, Destructive Generation, Second Thoughts About the Sixties. Also with us is author and noted speaker Winky Pratt. We're welcoming the gentleman back to the program. Um, let me quote something from page 287 of this book, Destructive Generation. And uh, here, here we go. Boy, this is interesting. 
Um, belief in the kingdom of socialist heaven is the faith that transforms vice into virtue, lies into truth, evil into good. For in the revolutionary religion, the way, the truth, and the life of salvation lie not with God above, but with men below, ruthless, brutal, venal men, in whom the faith confers the power of God. There is no mystery in the transformation of the socialist paradise into communist hell. Liberation theology is a satanic creed. Man, that's heavy duty stuff. I mean, that. <laughs> okay, uh, David, you wrote that. Uh, you know, what I mean by satanic creed is literal because the serpent in the garden says to Adam and Eve, you shall be as God. You eat the apple. It's the, it's the knowledge of how to get to the kingdom uh, of heaven, which is not to be given to, uh, to human yeah, beings. Yeah, but you ate that fruit. You ate that oh, fruit. Oh, I thought I did. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Marxism for me and the revolution was a religious way. That is, we were the chosen people, and we, we were going to bring a kingdom of heaven on earth. That's exactly the way I saw it. And, um, you know, I, I actually I was listening to... Um, the talk before about the music, and I, I remember the moment. I remember when George Harrison's album came out. Um, all, was it All Things Must Pass? And yeah. I thought he was singing, you know, My Sweet Love, My Sweet Love. What, and I, then I realized he was singing My Sweet Lord, and I said to myself, the revolution's over. Why? Because, well, at that time, I mean, I, I didn't have articulated all these thoughts about the relationship between religion and Marxism, but people were going back to God for their solution. And they were, they were not going to be looking, you know, to find it in the streets or, or in, dr in drugs. I wasn't into the drug culture in that way because I was a political radical. Or in the heaven on earth that, that we thought we were going to see born, let's say, in North Vietnam. I mean, we, oh. we believed, you know, that North Vietnam was going to, you know, Tom Hayden came back as early as 1965 from, from North Vietnam and said, you know, this is, a, this is something different. This is a, a socialist paradise. This is a general Confucianism of the heart, a Confucian communism of the heart. He compared it to, you know, uh, transcendent American historical experiences like the colonial town hall meetings and uh, black sharecroppers uh, get-togethers, this sort of thing. And we really believed in some sense that this socialist heaven on earth was going to take place and that the only st thing standing in, in its way, therefore, was the capitalist hell on earth, which was America. And so with this whole Manichaean, I mean, religious imagery kind of permeated, you know, the politics of the era in an almost subliminal sort of way. Yeah, well, it was, and it was in all the rhetoric. It was in so much of the rhetoric. Uh, when can you respond to that? Please? Christianity has always uh, viewed Marxism as a, as a Christian heresy because the, the, the goals and the dreams that tell you there is, no, there is no heaven to come but then promise you heaven on earth but not immediately because uh, there's still everybody must change first. And so conversion is brought under various forms. And the only difference between those two things is that in the kingdom of God, uh, the transformation comes from within by the Spirit of God changing a person's life. But Lenin found out that you couldn't just teach people uh, Marxist principles and have them change. And so I think the collapse of the revolution came about the fact that you can't build a kingdom on, on earth without it collapsing out of things that are not plainly true. Okay, I, one of the things that, again, David, this is back to you. You wrote a very personal statement about your relationship with your dad. Uh, and at the end of his life, uh, he was a man who had given himself to communism. And uh, he had to walk away from the, the, the idea of that, although he kept it in his heart, but he walked away from it. And you describe a scene in which I mean, he's dead and he's, there's going to be a funeral service. And to conduct a funeral service, they had to back the synagogue to bring him back full cycle, though now he's dead. Uh, how did you handle well, that? Well, they came, they came, he had the, when they, they buried him in a Jewish cemetery, all his life he really tried to get away from Judaism, mainly because, you know, Jews being a, a marginal people and uh, an oppressed people, he, he kind of hated himself, I think, in, in a way, and, and wanted to be part of this universal uh, brotherhood of man, you know, in his way. And uh, when he died, I mean, uh, you know, my mother, she had no comfort. There was no, no solace for her. Um, and she, she actually buried him in a Catholic uh, funeral home. I mean, they, they were kind of bereft of community, of any kind of connection um, to a community. 
And, uh, you know, it, it, in all these different spheres that we're talking about, we, people talk about one world. Yeah. You know, and, you know, there is a reason why there isn't one world. I mean, I, I'm not a biblical scholar, but everybody remembers the story of Babel. And, uh, you know, they were trying to climb to heaven, right? Build a, uh, um, you know, whatever. They were all getting together. And that's when God, you know, made everybody speak a different language so they couldn't communicate. And it's basically because we are human and we have these failings and we're, you know, sinful. And uh, I, uh, another thing that happened to me when I uh, left my politics was that I, I wished I had been taught uh, to believe in a concept of original sin, a humility before what's possible for human beings to do. You want to be taught that? You I wanted to. I wish I had had that as a teacher when I was young. Why? Because it would have prevented me from this incredible arrogance of thinking, you know, we could remake the world. That's one of the real lessons of the 60s for many people is to kind of come back to truths you can touch, to go away from these kind of cosmic quests mm -hmm. that became so trivialized and so vulgarized and to go to, to truths you can touch, you know, the love of the child, your children, the love of your wife, the, the love of the heritage that produced you, these kind of and settle for some kind of limited truths and touchable truths in your life and the love of God. We'll be right back. During this show, and uh, another show we've done in the 60s, I've been going through all this stuff. I was at Chase Stadium uh, when they did their concert in 64, whatever. Uh, 66, 67,000 people. We came in, I came in with a friend of mine uh, in, a, in a Bentley, a right-hand drive Bentley. It was a mistake uh, in one level because leaving, they thought we were the Beatles. And uh, the people got around the car. We had people with their arms and legs broken, man. They couldn't, the cops couldn't get to us on the horseback. It was frightening. I mean, it was mania. It really was mania. Uh, you, you were saying something, Roger, about George Harrison. You saw him there a moment I was, ago. I was at the Beatles' house, and we were all in acid together, sitting around in the bathroom playing guitars, and David Crosby was showing them Indian music, uh, Ravi Shankar riffs on the 12-string. And I asked George, I said, do you know about God? And he said, well, we don't know about God. And I, I was interested because he, he answered in the plural. He said, we, it was a gestalt, it was a, a group thinking. It, they weren't individuals, they didn't think for themselves. And about a month later or so, uh, he was into the Maharishi. They all were. You know. Oh boy, stand up, go ahead. I had a question about the music. Uh, back then in the 60s, the music was rich. I mean, there seemed to be so many poets. And I'm wondering, in secular music today, it seems like where it's so repetition. Mm -hmm. Could you comment about that? Well, we have uh, formula music on the airwaves now. It's all radio is programmed and it's all very formula. Uh, there's no uh, experimental music like there was in the 60s on radio, and unless you listen to the college stations, then you hear some more thinking music. Okay, the music. Much of what was being sung about then, talked about and protested against, had to do with the search for an answer, something concrete to base life upon. If you'd have asked the people of the 60s back then if they'd had it all together by now, the 80s, they probably would have said, of course we will. When they hit the 80s, this generation found itself limited and frustrated, which left it right to take advantage of the country's booming prosperity. Ironically, many began functioning within corporate bureaucracy rather than against it in order to achieve the values society was saying are desirable and necessary to find self-fulfillment. Power, money, position, and glamour. As they became obsessed with narcissistic activities, the 80s decade became speckled with an increasing number of divorces actually quadrupling since 1960 for those under 30, and fewer marriages, almost half as many. We saw a surge of singles bars and working moms, and the introduction of a new demographic group, the yuppies. Douglas Labier, a Washington psychoanalyst and author of Modern Madness, The Emotional Fallout of Success, describes yuppies as direct descendants of the 60s hippies on a quest they really don't understand and feeling a backlash from their materialistic pursuit. A lot of them tell me, after two-hour interview, that uh, while they like the perks of their success, all the yuppie appliances and material acquisition and all that, that they feel hollow and empty inside. Uh, and a lot of them end up saying that they really hate their life. They feel trapped. Some have dreams of being buried alive in a coffin. Um, there's a sense of real entrapment in a life which seems very empty, though materially rewarding. 
And that was the real disillusionment, finding that there were no answers. That wasn't, there wasn't an answer to what I was looking for. And when you find that what you've been believing in is not true, it's real discouraging. Discouragement hit a high for many as the stock market hit a low on Black Monday, October 19, 1987. Analysts say the dizzying collapse of the Dow Jones closed the 80s and has ushered in our next era. Almost overnight, the baby boomers' fascination with work, wealth, and power has begun to slip, and they appear to be looking in a new direction. Inner peace. Peace of mind. More inner, personal goals, I think, rather than um, a position in society. I just there are a lot of things other than money that motivate me. A sense of tradition, because I think that uh, we were brought up in a very traditional background. Trend spotters predict that the buzzword of the 90s will be cocooning, staying home with family. They say boomers will get into everything that symbolizes security and stabilization. Recent studies show marriage is on the increase and divorce is on the decrease. The question is, what significance could this apparent return to traditional values have in the continued quest for meaning in life? LeVere believes that many boomers will begin to transcend their focus on self and acquisition in the 90s and yearn to develop emotionally and spiritually. I think the uh, rise of interest in all this new age stuff reflects um, a desire for, you know, that whole mystical um, experience. The urban careerist in our culture has become so alienated from the larger world that they have become hollowed shells of people. And that's why I think there's a lot of longing for some kind of experience that will um, invigorate one's sense of being alive, of, of having feelings, of being a person with uh, an interior life. Okay, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to that and I'm seizing up inside. You know what I'm afraid of when I hear that kind of stuff? Wait till you can respond to this. I'm afraid somebody's gonna spill. I have, I have a real aversion to institutionalized anime. You know, I mean, I know I'm working for a company that isn't, <laughs> isn't an institution need to be an institution, but give it a few more years, you know? Uh, you, I, I don't want to be boxed into some institutional thing. I, I mean, am I just, is that just my typical 60s radical reaction? I mean, what am I going through here? Talk to me. Yesterday's radical is today's conservative, because he's so busy conserving the things he got by being radical, he can't afford to be radical anymore. <laughs> Now, wait a minute. Hold it. Hold it. <laughs> you, you see, what about no, it? No, no, that's what we used to say in the 60s. Um, I don't think that... Um, I didn't get conservative by acquiring material possessions. I think you get, you know, conservative by breaking yourself on this effort to transform the world. I mean, I, the people who are talking, it's a kind of sense of emptiness that they have. Yeah. And uh, you, you understand the risk from, the, as Roger said, I mean, you get to be 35 and see people dying when they're... 42, you understand that, you know, life is transitory and, uh, you know, you're looking for something else. You, think, you know you're not going to pile up things forever. Okay, right. And I, okay, wait, uh, because I mean, I, I like the, hey, I, my adrenaline was pumping in the 60s. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff juicing me. I don't want to uh, ossify in the 80s and the 90s and, you know, I'll be pushing my wheelchair in a couple more years. I mean, I'm, I like what this did to me on a positive side of things because I had a vision. I had a dream, yeah, it may have been idolism, mm. but it drove me. Yeah. All right? Scotty, I think we could have been watching that, that clip in the 50s because it seems to me like we're getting, this recycling is coming back, and I have great hope for the next generation that they will have a new set of dreams if we can give them real absolutes instead of the fake, shallow optimism we've had them in the 80s. The 90s people are starting to think again. Okay, when we come back, we come though. back, we're going to let, we'll let you do it. Okay, there, he says there's danger, but uh, okay, how do we get people radical, mobilized again in the right way? Is it possible? Barry may or may not think so, but we'll be back. Take it easy. Mobilized. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Well, I saw myself in there when they were Was having that you? yes in the Chicago convention, and we went back to the land, 
And I, there was a sovereign move of God across this nation around 1972, and a lot of us became Jesus freaks. And even since that time, when we finally came out of the woods in the last couple of years, I've been meeting other people that got saved in those two years, 71 and 72. Were you a political? Yes. We had guns buried in our land, and we were going to blow up the American government. How, how, did, how did you come to, to see Christ as the answer you were looking for? Through a trap. And when we were vegetarians track. and another... You ate a track? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, I mean, what are you growing out there? I heard some weird things growing, man, but nobody ever grew a track. Go ahead. Never. No, 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 right. Well, the only person we would listen to was the Seventh-day Adventist because uh -huh. they did not eat flesh. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. And so we read the track, and it was totally the Lord because uh -huh. I was not seeking God, to my knowledge. I was trying to keep from going crazy because I was crashing from the drugs. And Jesus Christ has changed our lives. Gosh, look at See, that's, okay, that's all right, all right. I mean, all right. See, that's that's what I was referring to a minute ago, Scott. When I said there's a danger. See, there are there are millions of people. The the clip of film we saw of people sitting there searching for God, opening their hearts, opening their spirits, and and one of the things that kept me from Christ from for so long. One of the things was the, the shallowness and the hypocrisy I saw in Christianity, you know? And, and, I, and I think at this day that we're hanging in right now, there are millions of people who've gone full circle and are coming back to spiritual searching. Most people think that the New Age group are pagan people, but they are religious people. The people who've already been there, done that, and got the t-shirt in religious mm -hmm. circles and found no real answer. And so have moved on. So we're witnessing the New Age movement the same recycling of what happened in the 70s when people begin to search in esoteric religious things and acid uh, and other things for religious experience. And I believe the exciting part about all of this is that I, I think we're on the verge of God doing what he did then again in a much greater much level. Much greater way. All right, yeah. for, the, for, the, for the person maybe sitting out there right now and watching this, and he was a pragmatist who, who is, uh, you know, he was political, whatever. Uh, how does, how does he tap into that? Or if he is God conscious, if you will, how do you focus it? How do you reach that reality? Roger, I mean, you... Well, I think that, as Jerry said, we have to be more transparent as Christians. You know, when somebody asks us, why not? We have to give them a good reason. You know, show them the scripture. Don't just say, it's because it's the way we've done it for generations. I think we have to be there for them. You know? Mark? There's a danger in expanding. I mean, if you, I'm here listening to all this go around. It seems like a pendulum, and we're talking every 10 years, it flips over 180 degrees, but it's like a pendulum going in all directions. It expands, then it collapses. There's a danger when it collapses if you don't have a focus of just maybe imploding, like a collapsing in on itself into nothingness, it's without the focus. One important thing that you brought out was that we need to realize that the consequences of where we are in society has come because of our own failure in sin. And I think this emerging generation has a profound sense. I see in one of John Cougar Mellencamp's songs where he talks about, Lord forgive me, for we know not what we've done. Uh, in in uh, Richard Marx's album where he talks about uh, um, we've lost the fear of God in the land. And I think in the emerging generation of kids there's a profound sense we've been born in an evil world and the only way to see change is to deal with the problem of human evil. All right. Uh, bottom line is for me then, Jerry. Just pick it up from where he was. Well, I'm, I'm really see where there is, is the danger because there's a lot of violent spiritual uh, spirituality around. But there is also, we, we, we stand on the brink of one of the greatest uh, revelations of truth because the more evil society becomes, the more obvious and beautiful the simplicity of the teachings of Christ become. Okay, but what's the darker it gets, the more easily it is to see the truth of of love and transparent compassion, honesty, Christ. All right, what's going to prevent me from being deceived again? Uh, hey, here we are. Mark? Being, uh, being, being deceived, deceived man. The last yeah. cut you don't get fooled by, again. By, by, their, by their fruit <laughs> shall you know them. You know, it, it's, if you look, if you look mm -hmm. and taste the fruit and look discerningly enough, you can't be fooled again. You believe that? Every mind has to find it within himself. But it, but if it really, if it, if if you look 
hard enough and really ask the right question. Ask the right question. Look inside and, and go one-to-one. Go -one. You get the answer, I believe. All right, Roger? I think you have to leave it to the Spirit of God to convict people of that and, and bring the reality of Jesus into their lives. Yeah, yeah but you know, I've got, I've got to tell you, I heard a lot of voices. Yeah. I mean, I heard a lot of voices right. telling me, this is the way, you know, and I go that way, and I go right. this way. It's like Dr. Timothy Leary, he was, I listened to the man, right. I dropped the acid. Right. I, I, ca I caught a glimpse in the eyes of a man on the streets of Hollywood in 1969. He was sitting there and he had a big chain around his waist and he was chained and padlocked to a cross. And I was working at a club called the Whiskey A Go Go and I came out with my head spinning from the music and the drugs and the adulation and all of it. And here this guy sitting there and I looked at him and what I saw looking at me was transparent peace. I'd never seen it before. There was no condemnation there was no there was just compassion for me I saw his concern for me and I caught a glimpse of Christ in that man that I'd never seen in anybody before i had been to the transcendental meditation classes I'd done all of that but I saw something here of honesty and humility and and it and it, it captured me now, what is uh, so I, I asked him I said what's happening and he looked at me and he said Jesus that's all he okay. said all right. and it terrified okay. me I ran I ran down the street around the corner <laughs> all right. yeah yeah in the middle of the journey uh, Peter you lights aren't over yet that's right there's much to, much to come huh um, you still inquisitive absolutely I think that uh, the best is yet to be rolled yeah. along yeah. with me the best is yet to be absolutely. all right okay and uh, what, what about you David I say um, this um, question of, you know, could it happen again? I said, beware of apocalypse and apocalyptic. People who think the end of the world is at hand, not because that's the moment in which you will break all the rules and, you know, you'll do anything. And uh, I, I think we should, you know, it's this humility thing again. And what Peter said before is very important. It's the touchable things. I mean, we have, you know, uh, we have a great country here, and, you know, and we have to defend it. Uh, we have, you have families, you, should, you have to nurture them and make them grow. Um, you know, your fellow uh, human beings are around you, you've got to respect them. And that's, that's the thing about the 60s, is to be wary of it. And the 60s, in retrospect, the half-life of the 60s is, is this apocalypse. It just seemed to, if you can just, you know, break through that final membrane, you can find the final truth. I mean, it's just it's settling for some human limits is, I think, important. I, yeah, I just say to you gentlemen, thank you very much for being on the program. And, and, and it is a little uh, statement that was made by Christ. You're not far from the kingdom. Uh, and Winky, is that what they're saying here? Just tie it together for us. Yeah. Um, it, in all of the, the, the darkness that, that we have inherited, there is great, great uh, hope for some real light and optimism. Now, I'm excited because the very said earlier, the darker the light gets, the, the more bright the light shows. And, and I think this next generation of kids both feel They've inherited the wrong of the past, and they want to start again. And I think it's time that we learn from the past and not repeat it. Okay. For all of you, for all of us on this program, uh, these gentlemen have given their bottom line to you in a moment. I'm going to come back, and I'll go below the bottom line. Stay with us. of the 60s were words, 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 so much rhetoric. There are many kinds of voices and many kinds of uh, all sorts of words in the world, none of them without significance. It's just sorting it all out. And that's what one of our guests said a moment ago. It is going to take some discernment on your part. Rhetoric or reality? And with all of that in the 60s as well, and as I mentioned a moment ago, one of the hallmarks of the 60s is a distrust of institutions. It certainly applies to religious systems that denote ecclesiastical hierarchies rather than interpersonal relationships. The reality of the future and the drumbeat of the moment is a spirituality that is pragmatic while at the same time being supernatural. For instance, the sick, the lonely, the disenfranchised don't need to be told, be warm, be filled, here's five dollars and God bless you. They need a friend, they need a meal, they need someone to wash their wounds and a commitment, a sacrifice. That's the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, that kind of a sacrifice will cost something. It means that I, myself, me speaking, I won't just speak for the plural body of people, as George Harrison did, but it does mean that I will set aside my selfishness and my self-interest 
and seek your good at my expense. That's love, and it has spine. I haven't arrived yet, so don't press me on it next time you see me. It is free, this gift, because the price was paid 2,000 years ago. Embrace it 